Good afternoon, good afternoon, WMNF 88.5 FM. This is Midpoint News and Talk with your host, Nola. And yes, we are back and better than ever on this wonderful Wednesday afternoon. And we have a few things to talk about today. So if you're joining us right now, hopefully you downloaded a free WMNF app. That's WMNF. And that way you can listen to us on the go on your favorite devices, portable devices. And yes, you can listen to us anywhere on the planet. And of course, we are do. We encourage you to donate to the tip jar right there because we know fully well 70% of the operating costs come from you. And this is WMNF Platform. I do encourage you to join the conversation here. Phone engineer today is Cindy. Thank you, Cindy, for being here today. And wonderful volunteers right here on the platform, WMNF. And the phone number to join the conversation is 813-239-9663. And we know fully well um, there have been a lot of protests like lately. When you, whether you talk about Portland or you talk about Kenosha, Washington, because of a shooting that happened on Sunday to a young um, African-American man, 29-year-old um, Jacob Blake. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the issues of the criminal justice system in the United States. And to help us here, we have a special guest. Yes, we do. And I'm excited about this. Sue Ann Robinson, a special guest today is Sue Ann Robinson. She's a counsel for Ben Crump Law in Fort Lauderdale. She has been featured on Fox's channel, Fox Business Channel, uh, RT America, Newsmax, America Trends TV, as a legal analyst on issues ranging from police misconduct to liability of major corporations. Good afternoon, Sue Ann Robinson. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And um, we know fully well you have a lot of a wealth of experience, and we want to talk to you about some of what are your thoughts about some of the things that are actually happening right now from the movement of George Floyd, in which we thought. We had a changing environment in this country, but henceforth, we've seen a continuous effort of examples of police brutality in the country. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, my thoughts are this was really never intended to become a bulk practice area. You know, this is the kind of work that you get into, hoping that it's going to slow down or stop or end at some point. And it just doesn't that that's happening right now, there has to be some sort of culture change in policing. It's not just about reform. There has to be a full-on culture change in policing in America. And, you know, it hasn't happened. Well, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of your wealth and knowledge. Can you talk a little bit about your experience as a prosecutor? Um, Well, I'm a former prosecutor in Broward County, and um, I have prosecuted crimes from misdemeanors all the way up to felony offenses before I became a uh, private defense attorney. And with that background, what are some of the things that you've seen in the system that you think are problematic? Some of the things that are problematic uh, from the prosecution side, a lot of it has to do with diversity in the profession, in the legal profession, and then especially on the prosecutor side. A lot of young attorneys that would say they want to be prosecutors, a lot of times our community, not having a full understanding of the system we have in place right now, think that's a bad idea. Why would you want to go be um, on that side? Because that's the wrong side. But really, it's part of a system, number one. Number two, when you're doing defense work, your client, your black client is already in triage, when you're on the prosecution side, you have an opportunity to look at the case for the in, from the inception and see if the person needs to be charged in the first place. You can actually look at what happened from the arrest on down to make the, the charging and the filing decision. So you have a greater opportunity to point out or root out injustice before it affects another person. If you just join us right now, it's the WMNF 88.5 FM Midpoint News and Talk with your host, Nola. Joining me is a special guest, Sue Ann Robinson, as of counsel for Ben Crump Law in Fort Lauderdale. She's been featured on Fox News Channel, Fox Business Channel, and she's here to give us a, a leeway, a, a wealth of information of what we're actually facing right now in the Justice Department. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to join the conversation, 813-239-9663, or you can send me a text 
uh, effective by 813-433-0885, or you send me an email during this broadcast at djawmnf.org. Right now, currently, I'm also broadcasting on Facebook, so I'll try to check that com- Facebook comments periodically, and that's at NOLA WMNF on Facebook. So when we talk a little bit about uh, of your special guest, uh, Soren Robinson, please. Can you explain what qualified immunity is and what a lot of people are talking about that? Because when we talk about the rhetoric right now, is qualified immunity is as a deterrent to changing the policies of various police agencies in our country. What is qualified immunity and how does it affect change in our community? Okay, so qualified immunity basically grants government officials, which in you know, the the case of police excessive force cases, police officers, when they're performing what's called a discretionary function, um, immunity from civil lawsuits, unless the person can show that the act clearly violated a constitutional right and a reasonable person would have known that. So it kind of gives them a little shield, and it only applies to government officials in civil litigation. So um, essentially what's happened is that qualified immunity has prevented um, lawsuits from being filed against law enforcement personally because you can't sue them personally um, a lot of times. And then a lot of times if whatever they're doing is viewed as a discretionary act within the purview of their law, within the purview of their employment, then they're shielded from liability unless you can prove or demonstrate that what they did was so egregious. So a lot of times in the cases that we're all protesting and working on so hard, um, the court will say, well, I'll give you a concrete example of a case that's going on right now. For example, with Breonna Taylor, we're all saying, arrest the cops that killed Breonna Taylor, what's going on? What's the problem with the issue? Um, those police officers were acting on a no-doc warrant at the time, which at the time was completely legal in that jurisdiction. So they were literally doing their job when they went into her home unannounced. The issue, so there's no criminal liability there necessarily unless something comes out later on with some audio or body-worn camera where they're saying, oh, we don't really have a warrant. We're just going to go into this person's home. That's the only way where I could see legally for there to be some criminal liability. But at the time, the police officers were acting completely legal, legally. But then you have to draw the comparison. Slavery was legal when it was legal. You know what I mean? So it's some things become outdated and, you know, the war on drugs is the reason why no-knock warrants came to to be, essentially. And we all know now from research and repercussions in urban communities that the war on drugs was really, you know, an unofficial war on poor and primarily black communities. So we don't like no-knock warrants, but it didn't trickle up. It didn't trickle up to be a flashpoint until Breonna Taylor's case. But trust me, there's been cases nationally going on where officers have done this, gone into the wrong home, um, injured small kids, traumatized families because of no-knock warrants. So they've always been bad, but they've also been legal. So now Breonna Taylor's case is giving us the opportunity to kind of remedy that and for everyone nationally to join together with a joint voice and say, hey, we don't need these no-knock warrants. We don't want them. We don't want that to be a part of policing. There's no circumstance that's so exigent that law enforcement needs to be able to burst into your home without announcing themselves. So what we're talking about... So the same thing for qualified immunity. It's outdated. It's not necessary. The current police culture is so wrought with corruption and officers that are just, quite frankly, not doing what they need to do. Too many bad apples. So qualified immunity is becoming something that needs to be obsolete at this point. So just just to follow up a little bit about the Brianna Taylor law, uh, law that you described, that you 
what you saying? Are you saying right now because the law was enacted after the incident with Breonna Taylor, those officers are pretty much exempt from being prosecuted or for being held responsible criminally? Criminally, criminally, it's a very tough case to make for murder if at the time they were acting according to what was a verified, what they claim to be a verified warrant. There are many civil matters, which are what the attorneys like myself, like Ben Crump, like Chris Stewart, like Lee Merritt deal with, which are if there was some negligence with respect to the warrant application that caused them to be at the wrong address, or if there was some negligence in terms of whether or not um, once Brianna Taylor's boyfriend fired one shot, if it was necessary for them to then shoot back 20 shots, whether each and every shot was necessary and when it became excessive. Those are all civil matters. Those are all civil issues. Those are not criminal liability issues. If so, we- now that, so now that no-knock warrants under Brianna's law have been deemed illegal, if an officer obviously would be held criminally liable if he went into someone's house and didn't announce himself now, but it was completely legal at the time. And so that's the primary issue is trying to find or fashion criminal liability out of the facts that were there at the time. Thank you for that. Uh, what of explanation? Cause I think, um, uh... I don't think a whole bunch of people actually understand what's actually going on because when you see a whole bunch of campaign out there, there's a, there's a big campaign to talk about arrest the officers that killed Breonna Taylor. And from what we're hearing right now, that's probably criminally almost impossible to hold them uh, responsible yeah, and for I, that. Yeah, and I want them, I, I, and, and I want to be clear, I think those officers absolutely should be held accountable. I think what they did was showed an absolute wanton disregard for human life in the way they conducted the warrant. There was nothing happening in the house that was so exigent and dangerous that such a warrant, they didn't, there were no human trafficking victims inside of the home. You understand what I mean? There were no allegations that child abuse was going on inside of the home. They were literally going there because they believed that someone who was a drug dealer lived there. Mm. That was the exigency. And I'm not saying that drug dealers are good people. I'm saying it's not a circumstance under which it's so exigent that they would have needed to execute a no-knock warrant. Absolutely. They have many, many other resources they can use to find people, to take people into custody without having to put other people's lives in jeopardy, which is exactly what they did in that case. Thank you so much for that explanation. And I think a, a, a lot of um, questions that especially black Americans have in, in America is, is a system of justice for separate people. I mean, we have, and I have, I've been a little bit more active on my social media lately in the past couple of days. Cause I mean, I get exhausted even looking at Facebook. I try to avoid it because I just get disappointed and heartbroken looking at the same people that I think I've known for years advocate when we have incidents like Jacob Blake. And to talk about, oh, but why did he resist arrest? Um, mm-hmm. what, 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 is the, what is the threshold for deadly force for police officers in the cases <laughs> that you prosecuted? Because I see a discrepancy right. between how black people, especially young black males between the ages of 20 and 40, had dealt mm-hmm. and mass shooters that we know fully right. well have killed a whole bunch Absolutely. of people. Can you talk yeah. about that? Well, well, the issue to me... And something, you know, I've noticed over time is that these types of law enforcement officers, these bad eggs, these bad apples, almost try to weaponize black skin. We were in fear for our life because this person is black. Mm. Full stop. There isn't more. <laughs> like... That, 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 that's it. 
you know, they've internalized, they have internalized racism and they are like, hey, this person is more dangerous because they look different from me. Now, we all know that to be absolutely ridiculous. We all know that a human is a human, an unarmed human is an unarmed human, or an armed dangerous person is an armed dangerous person. But, but when they, once we get to court and these officers are testifying in these cases that, they're get, that they've been acquitted on, their number one um, reply is always, I felt in danger. I, was, I felt my life was in danger. And the main issue that I always talk about everywhere I go, anywhere I'm asked to speak, is right now under the current system that we have, the current system, without some drastic change, what we as individuals can do is show up for jury duty and not self-eliminate from jury duty. And what do I mean by that? When you show up for jury service, do not say that you need to be at work. You have, If you're a teacher, oh, I have to give testing. Oh, I need to take care of my sick grandmother. Your civil duty and your duty to Black Lives Matter is for you to be there because the Constitution says you're supposed to have a jury of your peers. And if all the diverse people in the jury pool self-eliminate, guess who is on the jury pool. Mm. Guess who's on the jury pool? Other people that are going to be like, yeah, absolutely. If a black guy with dreads, you know, stood up next to me, I'd be scared too. These are the people who are clutching their purses in the elevator. Mm. These are the people who, you know, those are the people that are going to be on a jury panel. So when this officer says something unreasonable, like, yes, I'm trained. Yes, I have a gun. Yes, I have backup. But this person frightened me to the point where I felt that I needed to unload an entire clip into their body. That jury is understanding that fear or the claim, at least the claim. So that's why I say we have to get involved on that level. We cannot go to jury service and say things like, you know, my cousin Ray Ray had a bad experience with police. So I don't trust police, so I can't be on the jury. That's absolutely not true. You absolutely can be fair and are qualified to be on a jury panel because of that experience, because you're going to be able to listen more closely to what a police officer witness is saying based on your experience. You're not just going to take what they're saying at face value. You're going to actually evaluate it, evaluate and weigh the evidence. So having a bad experience, with police or remember having a bad experience does not disqualify you from participating on a jury and you should not articulate yourself in that manner. You absolutely can be fair and your life experience and your background makes you more qualified in my opinion. And so I always discuss that as much as I can. I'm like, we got to stop doing that. We've been socialized not to vote and not to participate on juries. And right now, in the current system that we have, that's where the power is. If you just join us right now, this is WMNF at 8.5 FM, Midpoint News in Talk with your host, Nola. With me on the phone lines right now is a special guest, Sue Ann Robinson. Sue Ann Robinson is a counsel for bankrupt law in Fort Lauderdale. She's been featured on Fox News, Fox Business Channel, RT uh, America, Newsmax, and many more. And she's here to talk about the current uh, judicial system in the United States of America and some of the things that we need to know. Okay, so uh, Sue Ann Robinson, Robinson, can you talk to us a little bit? When um, when a motorist, let's say at a traffic stop, what are the rights of a motorist um, when encountered by uh, when stopped by a police officer? Just to be clear, because it seems like from all this video, we really don't know what the rights of an individual is or uh, when encountered or when pulled over by a police officer. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is that when you're being pulled over by the police right now in the current environment, your main job is to arrive home safely. And I get a lot of heat when I say this to young men and say this at school. Your main job is to get home. So whatever you have to say, 
however you have to act, whatever you have to do to keep yourself safe, do that. Record the badge numbers. Record the actual experience of what's happening. And then when you get home, you can call a civil rights attorney to assist you with anything that you, if your rights were being violated. But at the car, at the roadside, with an armed officer who obviously they're not turning down, for lack of a better phrase, okay? So at that time is not the time for you to be talking to them about your legal rights, your constitutional rights, what you will and won't do. That's not the time. You cannot do it at that time because obviously it is placing you in danger under this current environment. So the officers can absolutely pat you down and ask you to get out of the car and pat you down. Okay, because they can say, you know, they have a concern that you could have weapons on you or something dangerous. So they can ask you to get out of the car to pat you down. So the more time you spend arguing with them about not getting out of the car, you almost have to be the bigger person in the situation. The main thing that I always tell people, listen, if you're getting pulled over by police, it's late or you're by yourself or you have a concern, you call 911 and you say, hey, I'm on this dirt road or wherever I am. I'm A police officer is behind me. I am driving to a well-lit area. I'm driving to a parking lot that's well-lit or I'm driving to a more populated area. And I'm letting you know that. So can you stay on the phone with me until I get there? Mm. So that that call is being recorded so that the officer later isn't going to be saying, oh, you're running from me or you're trying to get away from me, et cetera, because you have a recorded phone call where you're saying, I'm concerned because it's dark, you know, I'm alone or it's a dirt road or it's a place I'm not familiar with. And so I'm going to drive to a more well-lit area. You can do that. I think and that, I also tell everyone to record, record, record. So if you have a little camera inside of your car, there's some that go over your um, rear view mirror so you don't actually have to be touching them, like a phone where they can say, put your phone down, you know, or you're making an issue with respect to the phone. If you have those rear view cameras, they're super cheap. I feel like I should... Um, have a particular one in mind, but you know, you can order them online. You can hit that button. You don't have to press anything. It's going to record your entire um, interaction from start to finish. So later on, when you have to go lodge a complaint, um, et cetera, file a lawsuit, if it comes to that, you have everything. Officers can tell you not to record if they're, or to put your phone down if they're claiming that somehow you dealing with your phone is inhibiting them from their investigation. So they can't actually do that. So then arguing with them about, I'm not putting my phone down, I don't want to put my phone down, I'm recording you, etc., is also escalating the situation. You have to understand, the history of policing is in America originates in slave catching. That is the foundation of our current policing system. So it's not, it's not the protect and serve model that has been placed on top of it. You understand what I mean? Right. So we've never addressed the very underlying issue, which is that's the foundation of policing. That's what they, originally what people were deputized to do, to go catch a runaway slave or go and deal with those types of issues. So when you build a policing culture on top of something like that without ever addressing it or saying, we are stepping away from this, we are wholeheartedly cauterizing this away from what we're trying to do, when you just build on top of that foundation, you give that entire culture an opportunity to breed situations where police officers are rewarded based on how many arrests they make as opposed to how many actual, you know, valid arrests mm. or 
problems they solved during the day or their rating was in a community. They're being rewarded just based on arrest. So then they're like, okay, let's just go to where we know there's a lot of people, mm. you know, that don't have a voice and let's start arresting people so that we can get the most arrest award. That's not a way to reward police currently in the current system we have, but that's what is there. So those types of things have to be broken down. And then secondly, police unions. A lot of people don't realize, use your Google, police unions are very powerful politically. So whenever you're talking about trying to make changes in terms of training of police officers, um, in terms of equipment that they have, in terms of, hey, maybe they should learn to de-escalate. You have to go to the police union to have these discussions. These police unions have millions of dollars. They literally have their own lobby to donate money to various political campaigns for elected officials. So they have a lot of clout. So when you're telling your mayor, or you're protesting in front of your mayor's office, like, hey, these police are doing this, this, and that, the mayor very well could be sitting in his chair because of a police union. I think what you just so, what you just talked about right now is very resonates a lot, especially to residents in Hillsborough County or in Tampa, because currently right now what we have is a mayor that used to be a former police chief. And the problem they have is like they don't feel like the mayor is listening to them because the mayor used to be a police chief right here just probably less than a decade ago. And that's that's a valid point that you just raised right now. So I think that it's important when you're saying to people, hey, you need to get out and vote. You absolutely do. I would. I want you there. I want you registered. I want you voting. But I also want you informed on what is going on, what is happening, who are you voting for, what is the person, you know, what are they going to do for you, and if they're in office, how are we going to hold them accountable to the things that we need in our community, not just let's go vote so we can post, I voted on Instagram, you know what I'm saying, right. it, it takes, it, it takes time because you got to research the candidates, you got to understand what your own issues are in your community and say, okay, I think this person is the person who's going to be most in line with my needs. And then once they're in office, then you got to hold them accountable. So it's so much more than just showing up at the polls, checking the boxes and walking out. It's more to it. There is more to it. You have to then donate to these people's campaigns. If they are assisting your community with their needs, you got to donate to their campaign. Make sure you're helping them to stay in office and make sure that the candidates that you vote for are being held accountable. Because we absolutely fall apart on that part. I would say African-American women are the most loyal Democratic voting bloc in history. Consistent. But we've never had a candidate, right? Mm. So we finally got a candidate and for vice president in Kamala Harris, and there's this big uproar. And I'm like, you guys, we're the ones. Exactly Kamala Harris' demographics are the exact people that have been keeping the party going for so long. Mm. So why would it be an issue for her to be a candidate if we are the actual ones who are keeping this party going? Literally. Great point. It Great. shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Can you expand you on your have thoughts? always had a voice. Yeah. Can you expand on your thoughts about that? Because um, I've seen some people try to criticize the fact that I'm talking about uh, Democrats and the fact that um, in the party that we have somebody that used to be a prosecutor as a vice presidential candidate and potential vice president. What are your thoughts about that, about some of the people in the, uh, that actually think that's actually a bad thing? What are your thoughts about that? My thoughts are that we have been socialized and educated, miseducated in a lot of ways. And so we don't understand the system that actually affects us every single day. You need to have a Kamala, Kamala Harris as a prosecutor because, number one, she's the first. 
She has a breadth of experience. She is an HBCU grad, so she has her own unique perspective that she brings to the job. And most importantly, what people miss is a prosecutor is law enforcement. So if you look at it from a perspective of her job is to work on crime and people that are charged with crimes, she has a good record because she was doing what she was supposed to do when that was her job. So I think people misunderstand the purpose of, number one, diversity in the profession, being on that side, what it means, what it means to be on that side. And then with respect to um, Vice President, the Vice Presidential Candidate Kamala Harris, people miss the fact that what it takes for her to have even been there in the first place. Mm. Only 4% of attorneys in the country are African American. First of all, 4%. 4%. Wow. So for her to even be at that table with that opportunity, she has to be so on point in every single thing. <laughs> triple on point than any of her counterparts. So understand she has the qualifications and the experience that are needed. And she is, you know, I mean, I'm sure people could come up with other people that are better or they feel that are better candidates, but I absolutely don't think that her having being the attorney general of being a former prosecutor would make her a bad candidate. That absolutely makes, absolutely makes her a better candidate because she understands the other side, what the state has, what their burdens are, what they have to do, and what it takes to prove the case on that side so that she can better defend people. If she never had that experience, if she was never a prosecutor, she wouldn't know that side and what their tricks are and what their ticks are and what resources they have, she wouldn't know. So that's why I encourage, you know, us as a people, not necessarily to rally behind anyone because, oh, this person's black, so let's support this person. Look at it on paper. Just look at her resume and what she's done. It's like, look at our current president. He's not a lawyer. Barely graduated from school. You know, just, Cannot speak, cannot put a sentence together, cannot strategize. Like, it, he's not doing a good job. Let's talk about, let's so talk to, about, so It makes it difficult for me to, I, I, I don't mind listening to people criticizing different candidates. And, you know, I'll go back and forth all day right. about who I think is appropriate and what their qualifications are. But I don't want people to come from, a place of, oh, she's a, she's a prosecutor, so I can't vote for her. Right. Understand what a prosecutor is and what, what she did as a prosecutor. Absolutely. Excellent point. If you just join us right now, this is WMNF 88.5 FM, Maple Point News and Talk with your host, Nola. And yeah, special guest on with me on the phone right now. And mind you, we're getting a lot of compliments and people are appreciating the fact that you're bringing a lot of knowledge out there. So I just want to let you know that. And Soren Robinson is counsel for Bancroft Law. If you know Bancroft Law, they are responsible for a lot of these high profile cases when it comes to police brutality. So you guys have been in the forefront of this fight for a lot of cases out there, unfortunately. Now, we know fully well that not every case actually makes mainstream news. So is this as bad as we think it is out there when we see some of these um, cases that actually make mainstream news? Is it worse or what's actually yes. really going on? Yeah, it's actually worse than, than anyone could even imagine, unfortunately, because you are absolutely right. Every single case does not go viral. Every single case does not have the opportunity to have LeBron or Rihanna or Sean King weigh in on. It just doesn't. And the and a lot of cases are not recorded. We're working on a case right now. No one died, thank God. But, um, you know, a bus driver wouldn't let our client get back onto a bus um, to continue his journey just because he was black. The driver was white. And he was like, no, I don't see you on my list. He's like, I have a valid ticket. 
my ticket is very valid. The bus driver called the police and left our client stranded in a location where he didn't live. Just left him there. So these are little tiny things that are happening every single day just based on internalized racism in our country. That makes it difficult for hardworking Americans that are just living their lives to function because you have to be able to, you have to prepare for something like that. How do you prepare when you pay for your bus ticket? You're going where you're going. You have to be like, you know what? Let me make sure I have extra money in case the bus driver leaves me stranded. Mm. Why should you have to be preparing for that? You know, so there's many cases where we can't even we can't even take all the cases. We have to turn down cases sometimes, you know, because we cannot possibly deal with every single case. Right. So so it's worse than you actually see on TV. Absolutely. So like what is the role of the federal federal government and the Department of Justice? Um how can they aid in some of the uh, situations like like for instance like Brianna uh Brianna's law that happened in Kentucky. But in cases where you know what you have the Attorney General of the state refusing to do their jobs. What is the role of the federal government, Department of Justice? And and maybe maybe if we have a change in administration, how can they aid in making sure that a lot of these things, that a lot of changes that we want to enact as a country, it can happen? Well, the on a federal level, a lot of these things can be worked on by giving a voice to these types of issues. Number one. Number two, things like qualified immunity, which is a Supreme Court fashioned doctrine. It's not something that we voted on as a country like, yeah, we want to have qualified immunity. This is something that the, a Supreme Court created doctrine. So you're talking about the Supreme Court. Mm. Who appoints people to the Supreme Court? The president, mm. right? <laughs> So when you have a crazy person, well, let me not say that. When you have someone like 45 in office and you think about who he's appointing, you're like, okay, if a case with qualified immunity comes up and it has to be evaluated right now because of everything that's going on, do you think people that have been appointed by him are going to be fair? How do you think they're going to rule? You have to really understand those things. Spend time on C-SPAN. I know it looks boring. Right. <laughs> it looks very boring. It's not as exciting, you know, as the VMAs or watching a murder trial or First 48. But trust me, the gold is in there because you're sitting there looking at these hearings and you're like, oh, if this person gets appointed to the Supreme Court, they're probably going to rule like this or that. But that's why right now, you know, there's a march to November because we have to, whoever becomes president is going to have so much power in terms of appointing judges. And a lot of these issues can be stopped through the court. Um, or, or not stopped, but can be worked on. You know, as attorneys, we're very limited in what we can do. It's really you all as the people who are out there every day, who are working, who are voting, who are running for Senate, House reps, local councils, et cetera, you all are the ones that are doing the work. We're literally coming in as triage after someone's been shot, after someone's been injured, after someone's been hurt, and trying to fight for the family's rights, fight for that person's rights. But it's really up to you know you, all your listeners, to really hold elected officials accountable, treat each other with respect so that other people will treat you with respect. And when things are happening, really focus on what can I do as an individual? I will make sure that, you know, I show up for jury duty. I will make sure that if I get pulled over, I explain to my kids and I understand for myself that my main job is to get home Mm -hmm. and then I can fight for my rights. Once I get home, mm. 
excellent points. If you're just joining us right now, this is WMNF at 8.5 FM, Midpoint News and Talk with your host, Nola. My special guest on the phone today is Sue Ann Robinson. She's a counsel for Bancroft Law in Fort Lauderdale. She's been featured on Fox News Channel, Fox Business News, News Max, America Trends TV, and is a legal analyst on issues ranging from police misconduct to liability of major corporations in newsworthy negligence cases. She's here to talk about some things, so if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to call in. Phone number is 813-239-9663. I do have people on the phone lines for you, <laughs> Ms. Robinson. Okay. Um, and I have some emails here, a lot of complimentary emails talking about how they're enjoying your information out here, so that's a good thing. But I just feel like, uh, real quick, before I actually get to the phone lines right now, you talked a little bit about um, how strong the police unions are. If the police unions is as strong as you indicate they are and they influence every part of the society and political society right now, is it fair to say we're actually inching closer to a police state on the, in the underbelly but fully well like they feel like, you know what, we're immune to being held responsible, especially the bad ones and we have influence mm-hmm. in society. Is it fair to say, you know what, we might be inching close, uh, very close to a police state? I mean, because when we see the uh, the president, the president is not worried about civil liberties of the people that feel like they be, they need justice. Just today, just um, uh, in the last few hours, the, the the president of the United States tweeted, the governor should call in the National Guard in Wisconsin. It is ready, willing, and um, more than able to end the problem fast. The problem which he sees are the people that are protesting police brutality. He doesn't see the problem as someone that got shot seven times in the back. So what does that mean uh, uh, for our society? Does that mean like we're inching close to, close to a police state right now? And where, where do we see that going? Yeah, I think that what we're inching closer to is <clears throat> a breaking point. And I think that we have to really have appropriate leadership that is going to change the tone of that reform or what it's going to look like from here on out. Right now, you know, we have leadership that's like kind of willing to do whatever, including, you know, messing with the rain. What's the postal service thing? No rain, no snow, no sleet, no hail. Like, why are you messing with them? You get the people that are trying to make sure we get our mail, trying to make sure, you know, they're a part of the fabric and the infrastructure of the country. Let's go mess with them because I'm willing to do that because I'm willing to win this election to maintain the status quo by any means necessary and not in a good way. And so that's why we really have to, in this moment, be heard, number one, which is what the protests are about. But number two really have our demands simple, cohesive, and hold whoever gives an office accountable to those things. I think a lot of times, and I'm that's why I'm so glad that qualified immunity became a big flashpoint, even though I'm absolutely disgusted, disgusted and disheartened by the loss of Breonna Taylor, I'm glad that her passing away, being murdered in such a horrible way, made qualified immunity a flashpoint again because people will say to the civil rights attorneys, well, what are you doing? Because, look, these people, you know, they're doing all these things. They're being found not guilty. What are you guys doing? Right. Number one, with respect to them being found not guilty, that has nothing to do with us. That has to do with the prosecutors. Mm. And guess what? If they're not diverse prosecutors, guess how vigorously they're fighting police excessive force cases? So if you don't have a black prosecutor, they're not, you know, super amped up. And I'm not going to say all, but the the prosecutor being diverse helps because they understand. So if you don't have a diverse candidate on that side, then you're having a completely different conversation. And our role as civil rights attorneys, we don't prosecute the case. We're there watching, supporting the family, and that's it. You know, it's like a game where we're t- our hands are tied behind our back. Right. And so, see, see, you made that point um, I've, for for about five years now. I've, I've been on the air talking about how you know what uh, the the introduction of the video camera. How has that influenced uh, your cases? Has it made it a lot easier, or has it compli- Does this still have its complications? Because I have my own uh, reservations about that. 
about cameras where video cameras a, a lot of this incidents when we have a lot of this incidents because we know oh. fully well a lot of this incidents would be happening before i was born and it just seemed like a, a whole bunch of people thought you know what maybe a bunch of african americans a bunch of minorities out there were just crying wolf but now we have mm-hmm. Video. You can go to any YouTube mm-hmm. page and you can see people getting shot in broad daylight, people getting uh, choked and all that. So there's really no excuse that no one's not aware that this is actually happening out there. But for you, uh, how has that made your cases? Uh, has it um, complicated your cases more or has it made it easier? Or what has it done to the yeah. cases that you brought? To? I think what it's done to the cases is it helps the cases that are on video, obviously. But sometimes, like in the case of DeLuca Roll, I won't go into detail. You can use your Google. It was the viral national case and still is. Um, people will literally sit there with their own interpretation bias and interpret a video to be something completely different. I'm sure you've experienced it, right. even with George Floyd. Oh, well, he's there, but he's not really doing X, Y, Z. Right. Or there's other things that come into play. Oh, the medical examiner is going to say, oh, no, it wasn't a neck on, you know, the knee on his neck. It was something else. Um, You know, so it it absolutely helps because I think at the core, um, Americans are very logical, very smart, very intelligent, and can say, okay, I can call a spade a spade. I can call someone who's doing something bad out. Um, The cases that are not on video, obviously it makes it tougher because they're like, well, you don't have a video? No, everything's not on video. Um, body-worn cameras are not mandatory for every single police department. Right. So some things are not on video. Oh. But that's why, um, you know, re- you record those incidents yourself as well. And, you know, we're all grateful as a community for people that are working. When they see incidents that they feel are wrong, that are happening, they're recording it. Absolutely. So I think we've become more aware as a society on that. Yeah, let me try to get a phone call in here today because, uh, I mean, uh, this conversation is so well needed. And hopefully I will have you back here because I have a whole bunch of people tuning in here. Um, let me let me go to Mike from Tampa. Hey, Mike. Good afternoon, Mike. Welcome to the show, Mike. Yeah, um, of course, I think the uh, the uh, police that uh, committed the crimes and uh, were responsible for the death of the George Ford, Brianna Taylor, and uh, paralyzation of this other man should be held accountable. But uh, that's not in it by itself going to solve the problem of police brutality. We need a new society. We need uh, a society where the workers control production. And that, and only that, will, uh, will mediate the problem. Mm-hmm. And Joe Biden is not for that. And uh, we're certainly not going to get it under Joe Biden. Interesting. Um, that's an interesting uh, um, comment. Thanks a lot for that. Let's go to uh, Rob. Real quick, Rob from Tunnel to Sasa. Hey, Rob. Good afternoon, Rob. Welcome to the show, Rob. Hey, a couple of quick points. Um, if you, you get pulled over, you're asking what a person should do. Getting home alive is definitely one, but if they ask you whether or not you want your car searched, do not see. Hang on. Hey Rob, uh, you want to call us back? <laughs> Give us a call back, Rob. Uh, let's go to Danny real quick. Hey Danny, good afternoon, Danny. Welcome to show you that. Hey, that's God. I don't know what that was. A vicious song like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, what is your artist, real quick? Uh, real quick, I want to ask. But what's your artist, that musical artist that starts off your show? Um, I think that's Diamond Platinum's. Diamond oh, Platinum's Marry You. Uh, listen, yeah, I right. just want to say yes, uh, just to your guest, you and you're exactly right. You've been saying some great things. Look what we have in the post office, a con, another con man, another a New York con man, right-wing fascist out there trying to go ahead and help Trump uh, steal the election. And then we've got the Trumps. Listen, the bottom line is, guys, we have got to send these grifting grifters, these white trash back to Queens. We have an opportunity uh, November 3rd and of course Thursday the princess, Princess Ivankita is going to go ahead and get her, another grifter by the way is going to get in and, and get the main grifter out there and uh, this is we've got to go ahead, there's a secret recording of Melania cutting down all the kids including Ivanka calling her a grifter so all i got to say guys, thank be, you Be nice Danny um, be nice. And, and, and you know, we have a few minutes left, uh, uh, Miss Robinson. Do you have any final thoughts um, 
that you can get any final nuggets, um, any questions that I didn't ask you, anything you think we should know, we should pay attention to? Um, I guess what we should all pay attention to are, you know, let's look at the Supreme Court rulings on civil rights cases. There's a lot of stuff that just kind of slips through. Like, I know, you know, most recently, you know, we celebrated um, LGBTQ rights and things like that. Right. But there's a lot of things that affect other parts of the civil rights litigation that have happened since we've been in quarantine that no, no one talks about in the media that we should really, really uh, pay attention to because that's where the magic and the devil happens at the same time, mm. you know, in the law. And um, I also want to encourage everybody again, uh, I have some of it on my Instagram, but to serve on jury duty, if people have questions about it, they can absolutely DM me um, at not just a lawyer or send me a message. And I'll definitely do my best to try to explain it more in depth in terms of jury selection and how not to deselect yourself from um, serving on a jury. But we need you. When we're there, me as a trial lawyer, I can't say, hey, we need a super diverse candidate. Right. Don't uh, say that you have to go take care of your sick grandmother. You know, figure something else out and make sure you're on this jury. I can't have that conversation with you then. Right. But, um, you know, we can talk about the importance of it beforehand and secondly i just want everybody to treat each other with respect and you know be safe excellent points and if they if they want to reach you is there a website they could reach uh they could try to find some of information about you uh, apart from um... yeah um i yeah i can be reached on social media platforms twitter all that stuff at not just a lawyer and then i do have a website www.suianrobinson.com um. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I know I try to keep you here, here for about a uh, half hour, but we've been here for about close to an hour and I am truly very appreciative and good luck to all the cases that you you guys are working on. You guys are doing an exceptional job out there, unfortunately, but um, we do thank you for being here today. Absolutely. It's my honor. Thank you. All right, that, that, that was the show. Uh, that was the show. I tried to get a few questions in here, but there were a lot of things that we needed to hear from her. So, like, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to hit me on uh, Facebook, at NOLA WMN on fa uh, Facebook. I'll try to get her back here. And unfortunately, we keep talking about this issue, so we'll be right back next week. Stay tuned for NPR News. This is WMNF Tampa.